So as a break from Spengler, I'm going to pause to do a reading of uh, Walter Benjamin's famous essay on the work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility. Spengler got me thinking going through him about um, the nature of modern art and its status in uh, the civilization phase of civilization. Uh, remember that Spengler had said that um, works of art after which appear in the civilization phase after culture has expired and come to its end point that works of art once they appear in the civilization phase are just superfluous because the culture has already actualized all its possibilities during the culture phase so it's fulfilled everything that it really needs to fulfill to make sense out of the world picture the world as nature picture that it's building uh, so everything that appears in the civilization phase is mere dabbling uh, entirely unnecessary the culture is shifting slowly into an ahistoric mode and uh, the arts are no longer historically necessary they become just a collection of dabblers basically so he waves his hand at modern art so um, and I thought about uh, what Heidegger says about art in the origin of the work of art in the first version of that essay in which he says that um, the work of art he, he has a similar attitude to Spangler basically they both dismiss modern art and Heidegger says that the traditional great work of art in that it is world founding it it founds and creates a uh, an historical epoch's understanding of being and what it means to be in a particular historical locality, a time and place, as part of a particular people at a particular time. The work of art creates the, f it founds being and creates the, the whole sense of what it means to be a member of that society in that particular place and time. So that a work of art, and it does this by setting into work a truth event which opens up a world, a world, uh, uh, basically a cosmology, opens it up and it uses the earth in order to do this, to open up a, the, the earth as the concrete aspect of the work of art that has been taken. And rather than being used up in, in a technological implement, uh, which is just based on the form and matter dichotomy, and whereas the traditional understanding of art is formed matter, he says it's simply an appropriation of art into the form and matter paradigm that really only belongs to technology. In technology, the material taken up from the earth disappears into the form itself and dis and it disappears and the technological artifact disappear disappears into usefulness whereas the earthly elements that are taken up the stone into sculpture or the wood into sculpture or the stone into a cathedral or a Doric temple the, the earthly elements that are taken up uh, do not disappear they become conspicuous they shine forth radiantly in a way that is also simultaneously self-secluding because the earth itself is a self-secluding mystery. It's full of all these interconnections and harmonies, and it has a poetry about it that's inherent in the materials of the earth. And when the artist uses those earthly materials, he brings that poetry and ambiguity with him into the work of art. Earth is a little bit like uh, the Greek understanding of phusis, things arising and flashing forth, not just in a temporal sense, the way, say, uh, Vadimo misunderstands it in his essay on the decline of art, where he says that Heidegger's use of earth uh, in the work of art is just phusis, and that phusis really only means something unfolding temporally, coming into being, flowering and dying. It does not mean that. Uh, phusis actually means, and Heidegger's very clear about this, it is a numinous wonder that comes up out, flashes forth, it's a complete mystery, full of wonder, and then vanishes again. So Vadimo's image as a sort of late megalopolitan intellectual of Heidegger uh, he, he sort of sterilizes Heidegger and gives us a, a, a fictionalized version of Heidegger, a Heidegger that never existed, a Heidegger sterilized of mystery and ambiguity. Uh, the late l megalopolitan uh, intellectual is interested in constructing a world as nature picture that is completely rational, completely sterile, and completely clean, sh shorn free of ambiguities. And too often what I find in uh, the postmodern appropriation of philosophers of the depth of Heidegger and Nietzsche into their agenda, uh, usually a violence of interpretation, uh, as Paul DeMann put it, is exerted upon them uh, that ends up flattening them, sterilizing them, and it's a little bit like taking the caffeine out of Coke or alcohol out of beer. You end up with uh, the, the whole point of it being removed. So anyhow, the work of art then for Heidegger is this manifestation of a world and earth in strife, in contention, that, that tension between the world of intelligibility that punches a hole into being and creates being. Being does not pre-exist the work of art, it, it's created in the work of art. And in that respect, his theory of art differs very much
from the traditional platonic conception uh, that the artist is copying or representing banal objects which are themselves poor shadow copies of the platonic forms so that art is art is twice removed from the ultimate reality from being as eidos uh, that's a matching theory of art and heidegger throws that out in his aletheia theory since art is a kind of truth event and aletheia is the unconcealing of something while simultaneously concealing other facets that's the earthly aspect that conceals certain things while the truth event unconceals other things uh, through a self-secluding isolation of the art object that becomes noticed and stands out from the background of the usual things as they are usually uh, the usual concern art is not a representation of things as they are usually it's a singularity an event that creates being and it create creating being uh, it gives sense to an entire age when art stops doing that and apparently for Heidegger he agreed basically with Spangler that modern art stopped doing that uh, then it loses contact with being and when art loses contact with being when it's no longer founding world horizons then it's become historically superfluous just like Spangler's late megalopolitan art has become totally superfluous and is no longer communicating because it's cut off from being so works of art are no longer works of art they're just objects they're no longer things with a capital T they're just objects they're, they're mere dabbling objects little fascinating advertisements of banality and silliness and, and triviality so Heidegger waved his hand at all modern art and regarded it all as trivial but then I thought about Benjamin and Benjamin's essay on uh, his famous essay on the work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility and also his friend Adorno uh, in his essay on, in the Dialectic of Enlightenment on the culture industry. And I thought about their contrast, especially since Benjamin has a very positive attitude toward uh, popular art. Um, he, and especially in this essay, it becomes very clear and evident. His attitude actually is much more positive than even Adorno's is, uh, who is very dismissive about a lot of, of especially pop art. Um, and what Benjamin does in this essay uh, is he starts out by saying that in principle, the work of art, uh, this essay was written actually in 1935-36 at exactly the same time that Heidegger was at work on the origin of the work of art. Same time, exactly. It says, in principle, the work of art has always been reproducible. Uh, the Greeks mass reproduced bronzes and terracottas and coins. In the Middle Ages, we got the, uh, the woodcut, uh, which enabled mass reproduction. Uh, the printing press enabled the mass reproduction of the word. Uh, the copper plate engraving that Durer uses and then the lithograph in the 19th century but none of these in, in, any, in any of these cases did we have uh, the capacity to mass reproduce uh, in a technological means a technological matter in such a way that the technology becomes the main thing the main aspect of the process and then so he says that um, by modern technological reproduction he really means photography that which that kind of reproduction of the image that begins with photography in which the photograph that the camera is used to take a picture of a painting and then the paintings put in the book and you get Andre Malraux's Museum Without Walls in which we get all of these works of art that painting that the eye basically the camera is an extension of the eye can uh, rapidly remove from the walls of the museums and put them into your lap uh, in, the, in the pages of books with photographs in them of these works of art. So those kinds of reproductions are reproductions of works of art. And photography begins this process, uh, and then film also. And he's mainly concerned with film in this essay, but also photography. And he also says the gramophone does something similar. It removes the performance from the concert hall and makes it available uh, in your home. But what happens in this process of, of reproducing the image, reproduce mass reproducing it especially, is that the here and now, uh, the one thing missing is the here and now of the, the original work of art uh, is gone. And so what happens is that this whole, um, he says the whole sphere of authenticity eludes technological reproduction. And this is what, what he means by authenticity is the here and nowness of the original work of art, the fact that it has an aura about it, uh, which comes from the fact of its situation historically in a particular place, in a particular time, it has this historical air of authenticity about it that the reproduction cannot capture. And in fact, the reproduction, the mass reproduction of original works of art has a tendency to decay uh, and diminish the aura of their originals. 
So he sees this um, modern technology uh, of photography and film as diminishing the originals that they reproduce when they reproduce original works of art. And tech, he, he's more critiquing photography here than film. He has a much more positive attitude about film uh, than he does about photography. But he says then that he goes on to say that <clears throat> one of the aspects of um, the authenticity of a work of art is rooted in its cult function. Uh, and he's going to say that there's a, there's a basic polarity in works of art between their uh, exhibition value and their cult value. And that traditional, all traditional works of art originated, as everyone knows, in ritual, in myth, and in religion. And that original rootedness in the sacred was what gave these works of art their original sense of authenticity, hence created their aura, created the aura about them. Um, and that aura that is stripped by technological reproduction is also simultaneous, simultaneously a liberating of the work of art from its cult, from its cult function. It emancipates the work of art, secularizes it, and makes it more democratically available to the masses. Um, so that uh, he says that there's a difference between um, modern technology also that parallels this distinction in art, modern technology versus ancient technology, in that in ancient technology, uh, the user, the, the human being, is incorporated more into the process, uh, whereas in modern technology, the human being is slowly pushed out of the process. And then he says that taken to the extremes in each case, uh, the extreme of ancient technology's inclusion of the human being eventually leads to human sacrifice. That is the swallowing up of the human being completely into the process. The modern uh, taking uh, aspect of this taking to extremes in modern technology where the individuals push so far out that you get remote controlled planes. And I think if you knew about drones, he would use drones as an example, here, that, where the human being is just completely effaced and pushed out. Uh, so that's the difference technologically between ancient and modern technology. And then so <clears throat> what he does is he says that photography is the first of these new media that begins to uh, push the cult value out. It begins to just push the cult value out and begins to secularize the medium. But he says there's still photography, by contrast with film, there's still a vestigial element of the cult value in the fact that um, photography's early emphasis on the human portrait still connects it with the cult of the ancestors. And in connecting with the cult of the ancestors, there remains about photography this vestigial connection to religion, to cult value. But then he says that by the time you get to At J, and At J's pictures of empty streets in Paris, we're beginning to see the elimination of the human being, and we're also beginning to see the complete elimination of the cult value and the increase in its exhibition value. And it becomes more and more increased. And this is also obviously a, a, a forerunner, a, a prophecy of the. Uh, of technology. By, by now with the drone, you've got the complete elimination of the human being, which is a process set in motion by At Jay's uh, photos of empty uh, empty streets. Then, okay, so then he goes into the distinction between the two different types of technology, and then he says that um, the, the thing about film that makes it differ, uh, he goes begins to go into his comparisons of film with uh, theater, and film with painting. And he says the thing about film is that of all the art forms, it is the one that is most susceptible of improvement. And the reason for that is because um, what it is, it basically consists of is filming of countless images and different kinds of images from different angles so that you can have a case where Charlie Chaplin for a woman of Paris shot 125,000 meters of film just to make a 3,000 meter strip of film. So you've got this, ar certain, there's a certain arbitrariness in film in which, uh, through the editing of the film, certain images are selected by the director or, or the editor or both, and other images are eliminated, and they can be arranged in different ways. And there's always this er certain aspects about film that, that leave room for improvement. And I think this is an interesting, this is prophetic of the, uh, the later, or the coming of the DVD, which came out in favor of the director's cut, which then fed back into cinema so that we began to get revised works of film like uh, Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now Redux, uh, which comes out with all this extra footage. Uh, he's already foreseeing here this, this aspect that's potential in film to produce ultimate numbers of revisions, all the different versions of Star Wars that have come out that have been reissued again and again with more and more footage, more and more things changed. Uh, the, Lucas's 
um, unsatisfactory relationship with the Star Wars films is a perfect paradigm of this this sense that film is something that can always be improved. 